Engineering and City Planning, and I'm introducing Dr. Manasani. Um, so I'm just going to read off his titles, so he has a lot of them. Um, <laughs> um, he holds the William A. Patterson Distinguished Chair in Transportation at Northwestern University, where he is Director of the Northwestern University Transportation Center, and he's Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering with joint appointments in Industrial um, <laughs> Economics, oh, Industrial Engineering and Management Sciences, and managerial economics and decision sciences in the Kellogg School of Management. Great. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. <laughs> well, hold, hold, hold up the applause at the end. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, thank you uh, for well, first of all for showing up. That's um, always um, you know good to see interest in, in the topic. Uh, and thank you, Alex, IPS, all my colleagues here for the hospitality and for inviting me. Uh, it's always great to be uh, in the company of uh, good colleagues and friends, collaborators. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's get to work. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, autonomous vehicles. What else? Uh, we're going to talk um, about uh, shared autonomous fleet services in particular. And uh, we're going to talk about um, essentially network models to help us evaluate at a sort of regional level, uh, the impact of introduction of different types of uh, um, autonomous fleet services. And I think different types is the key here because as we will see, there are many possible um, business models um, that one could imagine. And of course, uh, I, one would be remiss here not to give credit to uh, Dr. Susan Shaheen, who really was uh, kind of the first to have that vision for shared mobility. Long before people were talking about autonomous vehicles, uh, she just re really kind of uh, brought the concept, I think, to, to us academics uh, and, um, and had, you know, kind of did several deployments uh, in different parts of the country, particularly in California, studied the behavior of people and so on. Um, but in all of those cases, people still had to drive themselves, uh, essentially. And uh, in some places, the economics of it was not always evident. Uh, but when you go autonomous, that kind of uh, introduces a whole new dimension here that changes the, the equation, changes the economics of the service, uh, certainly, and, uh, but, and, and also uh, changes the quality of service that can be delivered. So on both counts, the services become a lot more competitive, both with private mobility as well as with public transit as we, as we know it. And so um, as a researcher, um, my interest has been at um, really having tools to examine a lot of these questions because we found very quickly that the available set of tools um, that we've been working with are not quite set up to, uh, to, to capture a lot of these different uh, aspects. So, big questions. How do you plan for a world in which uh, vehicles are autonomous and or connected? Um, what implications for operations on facilities and in networks? How do you predict adoption of these new technologies and services given so many uncertainty, uncertainties uh, in terms of technology, policies, economics, new service models, and so on? And, of course, the question of to share or not to share, when, where, and what to share, critical issues, I think, in the whole picture here. And what should public transit do? Uh, because there are existential challenges, I think, for public transit in, in, in cities um, as we know it today. So to address these questions, I go back to my, um, to my class notes from, uh, um, I think it was Transportation Systems, uh, 101 or 201, every program has, has that, right? Where we understand that there's a demand side, there's a performance side, and we kind of try to capture those. So I went back to you know, Marvin Mannheim's uh, uh, old framework, and uh, essentially uh, what we have is you, 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 know, the, you represent the system through performance models, right? Uh, where you, then you load it with demand, a demand pattern, a flow pattern, um, and you have characteristics of the technology that gives you the attributes of the transportation system, uh, performance measures, travel time, reliability, and in the case of different uh, services, the availability of a vehicle or a ride, the comfort, convenience, safety, and so on. All of these attributes feed to the demand side, um, which we can think of as activity and travel behavior models. You have a set of activity choices, of engagement, duration, 
information sequencing and chaining and so on. And then travel shows it as destination road trip timing, etc. Now all of us have you know, seen the, this in any sort of basic transportation analysis course. Right? So you can go back to that and say, all right, um, if I have autonomous vehicles, that's a technology box, right? In the green box there. I change the attributes of the technology, and then I can simulate and get these other attributes and evaluate all of that, right? But um, in this framework, um, it's really beyond simply changing some aspects of the technology. And they are changing both on the sort of demand side, the activity system and mobility choices, and as well as on the performance side. So uh, Mannheim had labeled them type 1 and type 2 changes, and we're essentially talking about the same thing here. And so on the demand side, we have really new choices that are enabled by the fact that you now have a virtual chauffeur, for instance, that can become your assistant if it's a privately owned vehicle. Um, and uh, the whole pattern of engagement, picking up the kids, shopping, etc., will can, will, and can and will change. And on the supply side, you have the emergence of new mobility industry supply options. And uh, the tip of the iceberg is what we see Uber doing or Zipcar, make all of that autonomous, add in a variety of new services that they are uh, imagining. And uh, we're looking more you know, at, sim at simply eliminating a driver from a car. We're, we're looking at a whole new host of supply options that need to be captured. Okay? And so we've been working with uh, or for the Federal Highway Administration in developing what they call an AMS uh, framework. AMS stands for Analysis Modeling and Simulation Framework. And uh, this is one that actually we're doing uh, um, in, in collaboration with, uh, w w with ITS, uh, with, with the PATH program, uh, with uh, Steve Stadover and Alex Havardonis. And in the framework project, which is the first one that we were leading, um, we identified gaps in four key uh, modeling components or areas. One are you know, on the demand side, and I mentioned already some of these uh, changes in activity patterns for both people and, 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 and firms. Um, we then we have uh, gaps in terms of modeling these supply changes, uh, mostly mobility as a service, shared fleet operations. And in terms of operational performance, flow modeling, control strategies, all of which can be significantly improved. And there's a fourth category, though, that we introduced, uh, which is network integration, okay? which has to do with how you put all of these different services, trips, etc., in the network context. How do these different actors interact in the network context in, um, you know, in, 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 in choosing routes, um, in um, ultimately, and how, how that integrates with the, with the control side as well. It has to do with traveler assignment, with the behavior of multiple agents, various interactions, uh, whether you equilibrate or not, and so on. And one of the key opportunities in this, in this box uh, has to do with uh, the fact that you may then have very large fleets of autonomous vehicles that are in fact controlled by a single player, by a single actor. And so uh, you're all familiar students here with the uh, user equilibrium system <laughs> optimum, right? And the difference between them and uh, why people tend to follow more of a user optimized pattern as opposed to a system optimized one. And in the sort of uh, ATIS uh, information with guidance realm, we often talk about needing to system optimize and give people SO routes. However, there was always the question of why should people follow that particular route and so on. And um, now with autonomous vehicles, you can really control how you route them. But why would someone, uh, a player, want to route them in a certain way? Well, you and I, whatever we do individually does not directly impact the system in a big way. I mean, the system is there and we make our choices. If many of us do something, then we have an impact, but our own individual behavior is not that critical. Of course, if we all say that, then, you know, okay. uh, uh, right, nothing gets done. But you know, practically, in terms of impact on, on, on network congestion. Um, however, uh, if I control 3,000, 5,000 vehicles and I can control their operation, uh, then I can make, you know, I can have an impact. And so when that vehicle is taking you to work, it will take the best current path, it will user optimize. 
But when it's returning empty to do something else, then you can actually have SO flows for all of the zero occupancy vehicles that are being repositioned and so on. So there's very interesting opportunities from a routing standpoint where we can actually optimize because we're controlling these speeds. Now there's already examples in, um, in, in China, actually, Didi, where um, they're using their information and their vehicles uh, as input to time the signals. And of course, by timing the signals, it does benefit Didi. You know, their drivers are waiting less of the signals, but it also benefits typically most other users. It may benefit Didi vehicles more, but essentially the system is operated more efficiently. So it's these kinds of opportunity that we include here in the network integration box. Okay. Now, in this, uh, in the demand box, uh, of course, we've already mentioned the chauffeur features and the fact that uh, Really, spatial constraints on vehicle use can be, can be relaxed and because AVs are moving without a driver. And so when we think of a joint trip in, 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 in planning and in modeling, a joint trip will have multiple people going from one origin to a destination. That's a joint trip. But in this case, a joint trip may actually have people in multiple origins going to the same destination. And so from a modeling standpoint, we have to change essentially that whole entity that we call joint trips and activity-based models to route them uh, differently. So those would be some examples on the, uh, on the demand side. On the operational side, um, this is um, shameless plug here, number one. Uh, about almost two years ago now, I published an overview article on autonomous vehicles and connected vehicle systems focusing on flow and operations conditions. And that was in transportation science. And in that particular um, uh, um, article, again, we kind of take things from the basics and examine operational considerations. And we summarize sort of the findings known up to that point, mostly through simulation type experiments. And so I will refer you to that for, uh, as an entry point to looking at the flow and operational considerations. And some of the findings uh, that were, uh, you know, that are summarized there, uh, mostly through the, the simulation results, is that at low penetration rates of autonomous and, and or connected vehicles, we're really not seeing a significant impact on flow uh, throughput. I want to call it capacity, if you like that term. But we found greater improvement in the stability of traffic flow, leading to better reliability of travel times um, when we have uh, autonomous as opposed to connected even at relatively low penetration rates. And there's a reason for that, because for an autonomous vehicle to you know, give you benefits from a stability perspective, you just need that one vehicle, and it will behave according to its optimized car following rules and so on. With connected vehicles, it takes two to tango, basically, unless you have two together that are communicating, a connected vehicle that is isolated does not give you any, um, any, any, any benefits. Because for that reason, at the given market penetration rate, autonomous is giving you better impact on stability. Um, higher penetration rates lead to substantial improvement, again, in flow stability and sustained throughput levels. And that's very important uh, here. So I'm showing here the impact uh, on, on throughput uh, with, with two axes. We have the fraction of connected and the fraction of autonomous. And the, the remaining fraction are human-operated uh, vehicles. And uh, here, you know, that the heat map is for the throughput that we're getting. And so at the higher penetration rates of autonomous, of course, this is we're getting the higher throughputs. And that decreases as we, you know, uh, sort of at that fraction decreases. If you're at 100% connected, we're not getting quite the same benefit. Mostly has to do with the rules, I guess, that we use with the simulation. Because you may be connected, but you're still human controlled. Uh, so uh, we're not quite getting there. Now, Still, we're seeing here improvements of about 50% in sort of the nominal um, through, uh, capacity that we'd be getting. And one time I presented this result to, uh, um, to our congressman, actually, in the, in the House. He said, that's all? You mean we're only going to get 50%? Fascinating person, what do you mean? That's really great. He said, no, 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 no. I've been told we're going to get like 200%, 300%. And I said, no. 50% is already great. Then I tried to explain, you're already getting a bonus because most traffic as we deal with it is in flow breakdown mode during congestion period. So right there, you're losing 30 or 40% of that nominal capacity. With a fraction autonomous and or connected, you're recovering that. You're not losing 
that, that, you know, that, that uh, capacity drop. Plus, now you get on top of it this improvement, and this is reliable. You can count on it you know, day in, day out. We're not going to have that flow breakdown. He still didn't, he liked it better when, I think, when it's what, 200% or 300%. But, of course, we have to be realistic. All right. So let's now shift back to my main topic, uh, which is mobility service delivery models and integrating that in a regional um, um, framework. Okay? So fully autonomous vehicles, of course, are expected to accelerate existing trends towards uh, shared urban mobility for the reasons that I mentioned when we started. They eliminate the costs and the performance limitations that are associated with human drivers. They don't talk back at you. Uh, they don't listen, um, and, and so on. Um, they allow mobility services to compete then with personal vehicles in terms of cost and quality of service, which in most of our work has been the waiting time really involved. That's the main measure of quality of service. Um, and there's other technological advancements, of course, that lead towards immediate and reliable communication of instructions to AVs and travelers, but we have that on our Uber apps already. Um, and um, again, one can imagine both, you know, sort of future shared urban mobility services that are filling gaps between traditional uh, public transit and personal mobility. And so we expect to see a wide variety of AV fleet business models. Okay? So, um, as a way of categorizing or presenting these models, Mike Highland recently completed his uh, PhD with me, uh, and he focused on algorithms to drive these types of services in real time. And Mike now is uh, started as an assistant professor at uh, um, at UC Irvine, uh, so he's in the I guess UC uh, um, universe okay? family. family, I guess. Uh, Cosmos, I guess. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so he kind of had a taxonomy on the basis of both strategic and tactical decisions. So, examples of strategic decisions, uh, and this was definitely in a TRR paper uh, from 2017. Um, um, pricing could be variable or could be fixed, um, could be with surges or, and so on. Um, reservation time frames advanced requests or immediate requests. Uh, so the typical Uber service is immediate request. Your typical black car service is mostly advanced reservation. One could possibly combine those, of course. Whether there is sharing or no sharing of the rides, uh, whether the reservation is point to point or hourly, uh, whether the vehicles are heterogeneous or homogeneous. And so in a full portfolio type of service, uh, you know, Friday evening, you can get maybe a sports car, for a special occasion, uh, and maybe on the weekend you get an SUV so you can go off-roading, whatever. So the idea is you don't own these vehicles, but now you have a subscription into all of these different services. And whether the fleet size is variable, whether it's elastic or fixed. And so the Uber model, of course, has been, you know, bring in more drivers, etc. So it's a variable fleet size, but if you now have, you're dealing with autonomous vehicles, uh, maybe you have to own that fleet. On the other hand, if I have a privately automated, um, privately owned automated vehicle, I may send it to work for Uber uh, as well. So that, you know, some of the same ideas could, could, could apply here. And vehicle fuel type, from an, again, from an algorithmic perspective, if it's electric, has to be recharged. You know, that becomes another dimension um, in, the, in, in the routing. Uh, so these are all strategic decisions, sort of designing the service and uh, the tactical level, whether there is repositioning of the vehicles, whether one is diverting an on-route vehicle, so uh, you've already assigned that vehicle to someone, now you're changing that assignment, and the amount of time that you may hold a request before uh, assigning it. So, uh, so again, so Mike set out to develop algorithms for different types of, of, of models. He didn't do all of the possibilities, of course, uh, because there's many possible things that we can imagine. But he did uh, a few of them. And the first one that I'm going to mention uh, is essentially an autonomous Uber um, um, X service, okay? uh, where it's immediate requests uh, and you, uh, you, know, you just dispatch. And it's a, it's a ride base. It's not um, a hourly base or half a day and so on. The next one he did was more of an autonomous zip car type, but of course without fixed locations. Uh, because now the car can come to you. And also um, with um, 
with immediate requests, so no advanced reservations. So that kind of changes the whole, uh, the, the whole, the whole business. Yeah. <coughs> All right. So the other big question is then, what will become of public transit as we know it? And we were interested in having an analysis methodology to address, <coughs> to address that. And so we developed a framework to analyze the impact of autonomous vehicle fleets of these uh, shared uh, fleet services. Uh, so that we can have uh, then uh, an integrated, more choice, and dynamic transit assignment simulation tool incorporating ride sharing and ride sourcing with autonomous vehicles, that is incorporating that in the framework, and then connecting um, SAV fleet mobility optimization model with an overall multimodal urban transport network model, uh, so that, and effectively it gives us a flexible modeling framework that explicitly incorporates a first mile sort of suburban SAV transit feeder system. Okay? Uh, and so it could be you know, single vehicles, but it could be small buses that are shared, uh, that are collecting riders and feeding the, the larger uh, sort of transit, transit system. This is the framework. It's big. It's a large scale model. Uh, it's a two level model uh, with, um, with uh, at the upper level, uh, the, essentially the mode choice component. And at the lower level, the assignment. Okay. Uh, once you choose a mode, essentially the assignment to the network. And that gets iterated, of course, because the assignment will determine the attributes, level of service. Those will affect the mode choice. And we seek to solve this in convergence. In fact, the assignment itself is also iterated because you may load a certain path and overload the buses, etc. People then will, will, will shift. So we, we try to achieve convergence. At both both of those. Uh, this is, again, uh, again, this upper level here is the mode choice where you have, uh, you know, the modes that are considered are private auto, park and ride, transit, uh, SAV, and SAV plus transit feeding. <coughs> and um, the lower level then, we do the assignment depending on the mode that is selected. So it's a gap-based multimodal hyperpath assignment simulation. I'll say a few more words about it that handles the transit, park and ride, SAV plus transit. If you're a car user, we send you to DynaSmart and we simulate you, and I'm not showing that here. Okay? So the framework also involves the simulation of the vehicles themselves. We're not doing that here. We're simulating here the transit vehicles and the travelers as they get assigned onto the transit vehicles. So what we get out of it, we get crowdedness, we get availability of seats, and so on, at this level. And what you see here, this is the SAV optimizer. Okay? And uh, essentially, for those who are choosing um, SAV or SAV plus transit, those demand requests feed into the operator that will then assign the vehicles, and that will determine the, you know, all the level of service characteristics of that mode, and that feeds uh, on, on there. So everything, again, uh, integrates ultimately, and compared to, say, the ABM that we had developed, the activity-based model integrated with DTA we had developed for the Chicago region, this is the main addition here. Okay? Uh, and the ability to then take this as an access mode to transit, as well as a self-standing mode. Okay? And that's where the algorithms that I mentioned that Mike had developed will come in. So on the uh, mode choice um, level, then, this is a fairly standard uh, multinomial logic model. I mean, one can get much more sophisticated. That was not the objective. Believe it or not, we were trying to keep it simple. Uh, so it's a simple um, mode choice model here with, as I said, passenger car, SAV, SAV plus transit, park and ride, and uh, transit slash walk. Uh, the attributes that are included, whether it's a different uh, weight, uh, associated with seated versus standing in vehicle travel time and for long distance transit trips that is a significant factor as we know from our studies in Chicago and elsewhere. The wait time um, uh, that is associated with only transit or SAV or SAV plus transit so we compute those wait times for each mode and modal combination given where the users are located. The walk time, the fare, the probability of sharing and that's specific to SAV, uh, because that the whether you share the ride or not depends ultimately on how many other customers are available, you know, to share within the constraints. 
and transfers, the transfer penalty that's associated with it. So that's at the upper level for the mode choice. At the um, lower level for the assignment, um, again, we now have the demand based on the, from the upper level. And uh, it does sort of three things for us. Uh, one, it picks that load. It, does, it, it picks a path. And in this case, it's a hyperpath approach in a multimodal network. Uh, it then will simulate them to determine the level of service attribute. So you get the experience of the user, and that essentially gets uh, iterated um, with, of course, the optimization algorithms uh, that I've mentioned. So in, the, um, in that simulation, the, the assignment framework, uh, you know, the, green, um, the green boxes here, okay, um, this is based on work, as I said, that we had originally done for uh, um, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. It's a tool called NU Trans, uh, and, it's, uh, the, and it consists, as I said, of, of a tr multimodal transit least cost hyperpath algorithm with a multimodal time-dependent assignment and then a multi-agent particle simulation platform, which could be used as a standalone transit tool, or it could be used as part of an integrated tool, as we've, we've done before. We can use it for, uh, you know, to, to support service design decisions for transit and, and various other um, um, capabilities. The main feature is this. So the, the modes that are featured are originally, we have transit, all the various transit modes. And Chicago, like San Francisco area, has all kinds of transit modes. All, you know, have several agencies that run uh, both uh, um, sort of metro rail type services, regional rail, um, bus services, suburban lines, etc. cetera. Um, walking as a mode, biking as a mode. Uh, and what we've added here is SAV as a mode, both as an access mode and as a self-standing mode. But then from an assignment perspective, assigning drive, you know, cars to people, that's a separate algorithm. The transit assignment tool will only deal with the SAV plus transit. Okay? And so and one can add other modes. And in fact, now we're contemplating um, adding you know, uh, flying taxis and things of that nature. It's very detailed in terms of representing the transit network. Basically, you go to Google, uh, you know, the GTRF uh, sort of maps, and you can you know, you have that same level of detail. But the key thing is what happens at the, at the nodes, okay? So at the nodes, you can, you know, arrive using any one of the modes and then transfer to any of the other modes. And the cost of transfer depends both, both on how you arrive and how you're leaving. So it has that level of detail for the transfer cost. And to that, we have now added shared autonomous vehicle fees as an access mode to transit. And that's been incorporated in this framework. Now, I'll skip over some of the details on hyperpath because I want to present um, the, the, the um, algorithms for um, the SAV services. Okay? So, um, this is now the portion, again, dealing with uh, how we assign the autonomous vehicles to the demands that are arriving you know, essentially in real time. So that's a highly dynamic multi-vehicle passenger pickup and delivery problem with immediate demand requests. So travel, travelers request rides dynamically and want to be served immediately. So the request time becomes the earliest pickup time. And the operator has no, we assume that the operator has no knowledge of demands prior to the request time. So we're not forecasting the demand. We're only using the demands as they are materializing. But of course, they arrive at a very fast rate here in, an urban, in a large urban mobility uh, context. Okay. The central operator has complete control over the fleet. Uh, and he or she, the controller, uh, assigns the AVs to pick up and drop off traveler requests. And so we're going to examine different uh, strategies and the objective is to minimize a combination of operational costs that is in this case the fleet miles that could be other operational costs so that's the operator cost and traveler quality of service that is the wait time um, this is formulated uh, in a framework of Markov decision process models uh, to stick to the uh, sort of more of the substance I'm going to skip the algorithmic uh, approaches this is what it's doing practically okay we're here at the, at the purple line, 
right. These are all requests arriving at different times. The wait time elapses between the arrival time ti of request i and the current time. Okay? And this would have been the earliest pickup time. Therefore, this now is a waiting time. Okay? Uh, so it's the elapsed waiting time of traveler i. And um, we assume no information about future requests. Um, and at any given time, each one of these requests is going to be in a different status. Okay? Uh, you have those that are unassigned, usually the recent ones. You have those that have been assigned a driver but have not yet been picked up. You have those that are already in vehicle. And you have those that have already been completed. They arrived at their destination. Now, the, the, some of the strategies differ by who we include in the assignment. Okay? <coughs> Typically, uh, one is including only those because the others are assigned. But if that vehicle has not, if that customer has not yet been picked up, then the vehicle could be reassigned. So one strategy may be to include these, these guys as well. And another strategy is to pick those that are already in a vehicle and then project when that vehicle is going to be available and include that in the optimization as well. So uh, that's how, so they, they will vary by how many more opportunities essentially you're including for the assignment. And similarly, uh, there is a, a length of hold time before we assign. And the thing is, the longer you can hold um, a, a call, essentially the more, again, opportunities you're going to have to complete that match. Of course, the problem becomes larger, but on the other hand, you can, you can route things better. Okay? Uh, so, um, you know, we typically will hold vehicles for a certain very short period of time, not to exceed one minute, actually. Okay? And we've done a lot of sensitivity analysis to that measure. So the first two strategies that we're testing are pretty much uh, fairly simplistic. They're greedy. Uh, well, the first one that, well, is actually not even greedy. It's, it's first come, first served by the longest idle AV. Okay? The longest idle vehicle is going to go serve uh, that, um, you know, that traveler. For some, um, you know, when you're autonomous, the, how how long a vehicle has been idle is irrelevant because there's no, you know, there's no, uh, I mean, you're not making money on it, you want to assign it, so that's the incentive. But, uh, you know, unlike a human driver that is just sitting idle and is looking for work, uh, we, we don't have that, that, that consideration here. Okay? And this is similar to original taxi dispatching strategies. That's the industry where these are used the most. The second one is still first come, first serve, but it's assigned to the nearest idle AV. And this is slightly less myopic, um, a little more um, greedy as a strategy. And that's not too different from the current operation of the Uber, Lyft, et cetera, services. Though, of course, everybody has their own uh, considerations and secret sauce that goes in there. The other four strategies uh, are all optimization-based, where we have a formal optimization that's assigning travelers to the idle AVs so that the total wait time across all the travelers is minimized. And this is strategy three. Four and five are similar, except in four, we are including all of those that are en route so they can be diverted. And in five, we are including those that, are, that have a passenger in them, but are close to their destination, basically, as I mentioned. And six has shared rights. Okay? And this is the very important part of it. Uh, it's all the previous strategies here had assigned only one traveler. Here we allow sharing, subject to strict constraints on additional um, in vehicle time for for the for the passengers that have already been picked up, and we have here fairly stringent constraint so that that time is, is you know is not too high, and we've got sensitivity on that as well. Okay? So all of these require math math programming. Uh, there are similar strategies in the literature. We used uh, similar approaches in uh, for for truckload um, uh, routing um, in the in the. 90s and 2000s, uh, and now we're kind of using similar strategies here with autonomous vehicles. Okay. So, in the, um, so for the optimization of cases, the, the uh, formulation here, there's two cases. One, where you have more vehicles than you have travelers. Okay. Uh, so essentially, uh, all of the demand can be met with the available vehicles. Then all you do is minimize the total travel time. Xij here uh, is when you're assigning vehicle J to to customer I, CIJ is the associated cost with that, and you minimize that total cost, uh, making sure everybody's getting picked up. Um, so it's fairly straightforward um, in, in this case. Uh, so again, it's minimizing the total 
cost. All travelers must be assigned to an AD. An AD can only be assigned to one traveler. Uh, and Xij is a zero, one variable. In the second case, we have more travelers than we have vehicles, and that's the more common case, and that's where you have queuing. Okay? So the queuing aspect becomes significant. In the first case, there's really no queuing. You just wait for the vehicle to get there. We simply want to give you the best vehicle. And so it's similar, uh, except a few things will change. One of them is that now we have to add a term uh, to the objective function, which gives preference to travelers that have large elapsed time. Because what happens in all these routing problems, there are, you know, there, there are good customers that are located in, you know, in easy to route areas, and then you have dogs, okay, that are far out, and you have to kind of, you know, you have to incur a very large uh, penalty to get there. Typically, no driver will want to get those, and no algorithm will assign them unless they're totally empty. So if there's someone better, they'll go there. So unless you put a penalty term here to force the solution to serve these customers, then they're going to have bad level of service, and of course, no one wants to do that. Now, if you're doing revenue management, you can maybe refuse that, but if you are providing a service that says, you don't need a car anymore, we are going to be your mobility service provider, then you have to serve everybody who you have agreed to serve. And so this term it, you know, is included for that, for, for that reason. And then the traveler can only be assigned to one vehicle. So this, uh, it, you know, um, now it's instead of the uh, vehicle assigned to traveler, the traveler can only be assigned to one vehicle. And each AV must be assigned to the traveler. We're using all of the vehicles we have. Okay. Uh, so for strategy three to five, the main thing that changes is which vehicles are included in the optimization. Okay? So in one case, as I said, we're including those vehicles that are currently assigned but not yet picked up their customer. And in the second case, we add to those, those vehicles that will be getting into, you know, to, to uh, their destination at a certain time. And um, again, we, and for strategy five, we have to, to uh, you know, when we're including the, essentially the, the en route ve vehicles that are about to drop off their customers in the assignment, uh, we need to account for the distance to drop off the current passenger and then the distance to pick up the new traveler. Okay. So let me show you some results here very quickly. Uh, this is uh, looking at uh, the wait time per passenger. Okay. And this is comparing strategy two, which is first come, first serve, um, with the nearest idle vehicle. So the first one was first come, first serve to the longest idle vehicle. That is so dominated. I'm not even showing it here. It's dominated by two, uh, clearly. But these here are all the optimization-based strategies. And they clearly do better than first come, first, than nearest idle. Really, it's just that first come, first serve is misleading. It's first come, first serve and uh, nearest, idle, uh, nearest idle vehicle. Only when the, when the fleet is very large do these compare, which is what Uber tries to do and Lyft and so on, which is increase the fleet size. Get as many drivers as you can so that you can minimize persuading them. But with fewer vehicles, you can see that optimization strategies are really going to be significant. So we're looking here uh, you know, from 2 to 20 okay, uh, minutes in terms of, of waiting time. And incidentally, these are results for, so I mentioned that, we've, we've taken an area that is about the size of Evanston, uh, uh, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, and uh, we're simplifying the representation of the network. We're using Manhattan metric to, to move the vehicles, uh, and uh, we're, we're uh, generating the demands. Uh, I'm not going to say at random because we actually use the, um, um, the planning data in terms of the density of locations and origins and destinations and so on. But these are all things that, that can vary, though the same general results are going to apply. I have a super quick question. Yes. If you increase fleet size, does the ratio of travelers to vehicles stay the same, or is the number of travelers fixed? And the number of travelers is fixed. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, this is looking at the fleet miles here, so the operator cost, uh, and again, I'm only looking at the optimized strategies here, not because you know, we're, we're, there's nothing to compare. Otherwise, uh, you know, in terms of fleet size, we're doing much better, clearly, than the, uh, the nearest, I, nearest idle vehicle. But this is comparing the three cases where we only use the unassigned uh, uh, 
customers and vehicles. Then when we do the version, it's the yellow one. And the last one is when we include those vehicles that are about to drop off their passengers. So, which makes sense. The more opportunities you include, the better your solution is going to be. And if your fleet is large enough, then they, they become closer together. Um, this is showing now the impact of sharing. Okay? So shared drive. So clearly, with sharing, uh, you can reduce the fleet line. It's much more efficient. And that's a very important story because I think the adoption of autonomous vehicles is going to hinge on greater adoption of sharing. Otherwise, we're going to have a huge mess in terms of traffic congestion. So you can see, again, comparing it to the other optimization strategies with sharing, the uh, fleet miles here uh, are, um, are much lower. And uh, if you look at the weight pickup time, uh, the weight pickup time is also a bit lower. Uh, you're reducing the, 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 uh, the weight time on average for your users. And what you also get, though, the traveler in vehicle travel time will increase, obviously, because now you're part of the tour. Uh, and the extent of the increase, of course, is controlled by the fleet size that we're using. Okay. So that's the first um, type of uh, um, mobility services that are operated. We have another one for which we have uh, some results, but I'm going to be skipping those. This is an on-demand autonomous car sharing service, okay, uh, where um, it's essentially the vehicle comes to you. Uh, you leave it wherever, you, wherever you, you stop. You keep it for a certain period, and uh, essentially you specify when you want it, how long you want to keep it, so you're not necessarily uh, committed to when you leave it. You can keep it as long as you wish, essentially, then that, you know, that enters in the, in the optimization. And um, rebalancing uh, may also be a strategy that one could use here. All right? So, gonna, so we've used similar ideas, similar types of algorithm, but this gets more complicated, I'm skipping all of those. Um, and you could look at, uh, for instance, uh, what happened, you know, a comparison of nearest neighbor assignment to uh, assigning the idle vehicles and idle plus those that are to be dropped off, and a third strategy with, with repositioning, uh, and repositioning also considering the idle drop off. So uh, in the blue one, the you know, one that's doing really best in terms of user wait time is one with repositioning. And the repositioning is optimized in the formulation. Uh, the green one is without repositioning, and the uh, red one is simply nearest neighbor type assignment. Again, a fairly myopic strategy. Okay. Uh, we here then, again, you look at the uh, empty uh, fleet miles that are associated with it. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the repositioning adds a little bit of mileage, actually, because these are empty miles to reposition the vehicle. So there's a trade-off between reducing wait time and incurring a little more uh, distance cost here. And, but overall, then you take the weighted cost, of course, and with repositioning, you end up with, with much better strategy. All right. So this is the last piece here. Uh, so we've taken uh, this service um, um, uh, optimization tool. And we now going back to the overall framework that I showed you, the two levels with uh, the mode choice and then the assignment. Um, we've taken that optimization algorithm and integrated that with the, uh, with the assignment tool. And we took Evanston, Illinois, uh, which is where Northwestern is, just north of Chicago. And uh, we, we uh, essentially um, did a case study, did the morning peak period, uh, where in the overall Chicago area there's more than 2.1 million trips. In Evanston itself, there's more than 35,000 trips. We said, let's say that in Evanston only, we're going to have autonomous uh, fleet services. We're going to have shared autonomous vehicle fleet operating only in Evanston in terms of pickup, but it can take you anywhere, OK? Um, with 300 vehicles that are strictly roaming Evanston, and then they will, again, for pickup, it then take you anywhere. And uh, we then had a strategy where the theater SAV is limited to two mile distance from transit, and that's something that we can Flex, yes. And quick clarification, so if you only take from Evanston to somewhere, do you have to have a rebalance strategy? Or, or it, you know, we're only doing morning peak. Oh, okay, so we, then you, we, we, you we could, we didn't get there yet. Okay. Uh, we didn't get there. We were only using the optimizer to get the level of service attributes so we can do the regional model. Okay. Uh, but we are considering, in terms of the transit 
system itself, which was our focus here, we have all of the trips in the Chicago area that are modeled. Okay? Um, three cases. The first case is the current situation where we have buses, we have rail, and we have private cars. Okay? Uh, we're not including Uber explicitly here. Okay? Uh, then we added SAVs as a mode um, to the existing one. Then we did the drastic cases. Let's get rid of the buses. You know, let's just get rid of the buses here and only have SAVs. Keep the rail service and the private cars, just as a, an extreme case, and see what, what, what would happen um, in here. And so for pricing, uh, we price the SAV service essentially like Uber Pool. Okay, we use exactly the same race that they have uh, for, for, for realism. And, uh, well, algorithmically, of course, we, we, we do gap-based here assignment. So uh, this is showing you the convergence of the gap for all three scenarios. This is the average transit assignment gap per traveler, so it's a conversion process. And this is the mode choice gap, which, again, in all three scenarios is converging. You know, that's kind of on the algorithmic side. Because really, you cannot prove convergence of these very large models with simulation embedded in them, but it's nice to, to see that we're, 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 we're getting there. These are the main results here in terms of uh, the, the shares of the different modes. Okay? And so uh, we have the, the base case is in blue. Uh, when you add SAVs, it's in orange. And then whatever this color is, is when you replace uh, buses with SAVs. Uh, that's the, the third scenario. Okay? And so we're looking at the car share. We're looking at the transit share, which drops dramatically as we add these services. We're looking at walk share. And we look at the SAV share, of course, that increases. And SAV plus transit, SAV plus walk. So when you combine them into non-car and overall transit uh, shares here, what we find um, is there's a 26% increase in the non-car share, which we like to see. Uh, but there is a 50% reduction in the overall transit share. Okay? Uh, so looking at, at these results, 10% reduction in car share, 68% reduction in transit, and then reduction. So the reduction in walking may be an artifact of the assignment, because it's at that level that we determine that somebody's walking. Uh, so uh, I'm not putting too much faith in the walking results. But in terms of stealing share, I think there's an interesting message here uh, that we've been trying to convey to, uh, to the, our friends in the transit agencies. Okay. Some other uh, uh, pertinent results here. Um, the probability of sharing a ride uh, in, in under the constraints that we have. When we, uh, so when we simply add the SAVs, uh, the probability of sharing for all of the SAV trips is about 37%. Uh, in the case, this is for, for the SAV only, and for SAV plus transit, about 42%. And this is what comes out of the optimization. Um, and when we replace the buses, of course, that increases further. Uh, it's, uh, it's about 44%. And then with S for SAV transit, roughly 49.3%. And th these are the average waiting times for the SAV traveler. Of course, this is all in the Evanston area. Those look quite, quite good, of course. Um, then, what else do we have? So the interesting thing is that if you look at it from uh, overall service quality, you, you take the total generalized cost uh, for the user, uh, comparing the base case uh, to, uh, to adding SAV and replacing buses, virtually on every measure, um, we're uh, virtually on every measure um, you finding that, um, well, certainly the wait time is dropping considerably. The in-vehicle travel time is dropping. The fare ends up being lower, but that's possibly an artifact of how we, we you know, of what we use. But we did use current transit fares in the region and the Uber uh, pool vehicles um, uh, fares. And the equilibrated system then with SAVs ended up being more cost beneficial to the average user than the base case of the cost being 3.4 versus 3.1. Okay? Uh, this is when you kind of look at the generalized cost once the system equilibrates. So there is an improvement there. So what does that mean ultimately? Uh, and what should transit agencies do? Okay? 
uh, in this picture. And we're not saying get rid of the buses, obviously, but we want to challenge, I think, agencies to think about what to do with the potential impact that introducing these services with the better quality of service and competitive uh, uh, cost uh, would do. Okay? Well, first we think they should embrace change and rethink how to best accomplish their mission. Okay? Uh, and so the transit agency could think of itself as the mobility as a service provider. Uh, then you, know, you think mobility, not just transit. Um, and, that, and there's different models there. The agency could own the autonomous vehicle fleets, including small buses, which would then encourage sharing, and provide some form of SAV operation. That's the model that cities like uh, uh, Helsinki, for example, are adopting. Many European cities are going that particular route. You could contract out with a third party to provide these same services with varying degrees of control. You know, Lyft is friend of transit, so there's that, that argument. Or you could let the private sector work out what is a preferred profitable business model and maybe facilitating intermodal access. And we think there are parts of the country that may like would go with that, uh, others that would try to control the process more. But in all cases, we think they should not just ignore it. Uh, most importantly, we've tried to put this now in a network design context and to say, if I have so many dollars, how should I best invest them? And what you find in all cases, instead of putting more service on bus lines that are doing collector feeder type service, you're much better off relying on SAV type models and put your money where, you, where transit is really best, which is to move very large numbers of people efficiently to dense areas. That means better rail service, that means bus rapid transit, and again, services where you're not stopping to do pickup and, 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 and drop off, essentially. It seems straightforward, it seems obvious, but we need to have some numbers to keep hitting. On, on, you know, on these particular issues, and in fact, to, to come up with, with uh, uh, you know, best scenar scenarios and evaluate proposed scenarios. Of course, other recommendations here is to facilitate engagement, private sector and application developers, making data available, readily in standard formats, and so on. So, uh, that's my talk exactly at five. <laughs>